Great to be with you. If you have a Bible, go with me to 1 Kings 19. We'll be in 1 Kings 19, verse 1 here in just a second. And um, what I want to talk to you about today has been described recently. So in his uh, book that came out in the last year, Rain Wilson, who played Dwight on The Office, uh, wrote a book called Soul Boom, where he's looking at this. He's not a Christian. It's not a Christian book, but he's talking about a need for spiritual awakening in America. And in the second chapter of his book, he talks about what he calls uh, a plethora of pandemics that are threatening our country, causing all kinds of grief and heartache. And one of the ones that he mentions is a mental health pandemic. And so I want to talk to you about uh, this mental health pandemic this morning. And this is something that honestly, especially for your generation, uh, is at a crisis point, honestly. There's a, a picture I think we're going to have that we will we'll put up on the screen. This just came out recently. And what, they, what they've done is they've, detr- they've tracked uh, kind of depressive symptoms among 8th through 12th graders over the last 30 years. So this from 1990 to 2020, right before the pandemic, okay? And what they noticed is almost a doubling effect in depressive symptoms among people your age over the last 30 years with statements like, I can't do anything right, which has doubled. My life is not useful, which has doubled. And I do not enjoy life. And that has um, gone on this massive trajectory up where your generation is struggling with these things. Not only that, but since the pandemic, so since COVID, there's been a 50% rise in mental health ER visits for young people. So a 50% rise in just in the last three years. Now, why, why, uh, you know, young people are struggling with, and and not just young people, but adult, uh, older adults as well are struggling with these mental health uh, issues and disorders. There's any number of reasons that could contribute to why this is the case. Okay. It could be some painful life experience that you've gone through and you just haven't been able to deal with it and you don't know how to get past it. It could just be something as simple as exhaustion. You're burning the candle at both ends and you don't get enough sleep. And so because of that, you're wrestling with these things. It could be something like disappointment. Just my life's not turning out the way that I wanted it to. My relationships aren't turning out the way that I wanted them to. My family's not what I want it to be. And so disappointment could be a factor. It could be loneliness. Uh, Social media has uh, lots of contributing factors to uh, this. It could be something like repressed anger that you have at a parent or uh, a coach or a friend or somebody, an ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend. It could be sin uh, that you're committing and that you're engaged in. So there's any number of reasons why you might be struggling right now in terms of your mental health. Okay, but what I want to walk through today is some strategies that we can use to try to fight for mental wellness in our lives. Let me just make a couple of caveats here at the beginning before we jump into God's Word. The first one is this. We need to distinguish between sadness and depression. Okay, oftentimes we kind of can self-diagnose ourselves and say, I'm depressed when you might really mean sadness, like depression is different from and distinct from sadness. It's an illness that affects the, the body, the mind, the mood. It, it, it affects your sleep patterns. It affects your, your, your diet. It causes you to withdraw from normal activities. It's just feelings of worthlessness and, and that kind of thing. And uh, one of the things that I'm really grateful for being a part of the Carson Newman family is that we have so many gifted and talented people on our campus. I uh, met recently with some of our psychology professors to just talk through this message and, and to make sure that, that everything that we say today is going to be as helpful for you as it can be. And so one of the things that, that they helped uh, me with is, is to put together a PDF that we're going to provide for you. There'll be a, a QR code here on the screen at some point that you can, you can uh, use your camera, click on that, and then it'll have all kinds of resources for you in order to try to help you with this, uh, this issue, okay? One of the things that you'll see in that PDF are um, just, uh, again, how you might struggle with depression or might be struggling with despair and like a checklist to tell you if you need to, 
to maybe talk to somebody, if you need to talk to a therapist or you need to go see a doctor, because that's the other thing I want to make very clear is that this may be something where you need to talk to somebody. Uh, you may need to meet with a doctor and, and people call me Dr. Aiken, but I'm not that kind of doctor. Okay. And so uh, if you need to meet with somebody, there's a, there's a way you can look on there and see, man, diagnose and say, man, I, I, I probably need to reach out to and talk to somebody because this is a very complex, multifaceted issue. And so I want to be very clear. If you've ever had a pastor say to you, well, if you just had enough faith, you wouldn't be dealing with this. I'm not going to say that today because I don't think that that's true. All right. This is a very complex issue. And so I'm not going to say, well, if you'll just have enough faith and you won't ever, you know, struggle with despair again, you won't ever have any mental health uh, challenges in your life. That that's not the case. This is a very multifaceted issue. Okay. And, and we are whole beings as humans. We are mind, soul, body. And, and not only that, sin can affect and the, and the fall of mankind and the sin can affect all the different parts of us. It can affect our emotions. It can affect our, our, uh, our physical being in terms of just exhaustion and being tired. It can affect our mind and our, you know, just our, our mindset. And so uh, this is a very multifaceted issue, which means it needs a multi-solution approach. Okay, it can't just be a pastor saying, read these verses and then call me in the morning. It can't just be a therapist trying to work on, you know, behavioral issues. You can't just be a doctor just prescribing medicine. It needs to, we need all of these things together. And the good news that we see in this text this morning is that God is concerned about all of those things. And God is concerned about giving us a multi-solution approach to this. So what we're going to look at today in 1 Kings 19 is the story of a man named Elijah. And Elijah was a giant of the faith, okay? So if you think that if you're struggling with mental health issues or maybe struggling with depression, that that somehow makes you a bad person or a bad Christian, that's not the case, okay? Elijah was the first person, think about this, Elijah was the first person in human existence to raise somebody from the dead. Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed again and then all of a sudden it began to rain. And right before the story that we're going to look at here in 1 Kings 19, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah, who was kind of a hunted man in the northern kingdom of Israel, it had become a, a nation that was worshiping idols, worshiping these idols called the Baals. Ahab was king, his wife Jezebel was the queen, and they were trying to, to, to get rid of all worship of the one true God in Israel. And so they had killed all these prophets. They were trying to kill Elijah, and Elijah finally said, enough is enough, and he he called all the people of Israel together with Ahab and all the false prophets that were worshiping these idols. And he called them to this mountain called Mount Carmel. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a showdown to see who is the true God. And so I'm going to call on the one true God to bring down fire from heaven. Baal's prophets, you call on Baal to bring down fire from heaven. Whoever brings, brings down fire from heaven, that's the real God. And Baal's prophets prayed and danced and cut themselves for six hours. They got no answer from their supposed God. Elijah prayed and all of a sudden fire came down from heaven. And then he rounded up all of these false prophets and he had them killed. And it looked like revival was going to take place in Israel. So Elijah is coming off of this incredible spiritual high where he's seen God show up in an amazing way, and within 24 hours, he's going to be so depressed that he's suicidal. And he's going to ask God to take his life. And we're going to see here in 1 Kings 19 some, some strategies for fighting for mental health and wellness. So in preparation for our study, let's start here. 1 Kings 19, verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 8. This is what God's Word said. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. 
And he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Rise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Four things I want us to see this morning in this story, four strategies for uh, mental wellness. The first is this, you need to practice self-care. You need to practice self-care. Again, uh, all that's been happening in this story is Elijah has this incredible spiritual high at Mount Carmel. After those events, King Ahab runs home to his wife Jezebel. He tattles and says, listen to what Elijah did. And so Jezebel responds by putting a hit on Elijah's life. She hires assassins and she says, I'm going to track you down and I'm going to kill you within 24 hours. And so Elijah, all the way from the northern kingdom, all the way to the south, he sits under a tree and he asks God to kill him. Now, this is Kind of shocking because, again, 24 hours earlier, Elijah's there at Mount Carmel. It's a 450 to 1 ratio. All of these prophets are there. King Ahab is there. They want to kill him. And he's fearless. He's so fearless that when the prophets of Baal are are crying out to their God and they're not getting an answer with no fire from, from the sky, he starts to mock them. And he says, hey, listen, ramp it up. Cry out louder. Maybe he's on a trip. Maybe your God has, you know, gone to the bathroom and so he can't answer you. And so just kind of ramp it up, boys. He's so confident. And so you're expecting when he hears that this woman wants to kill him and that she's put out a hit on his life for him to respond, well, you and what army? I've got God on my side. So like, I I don't know what you think you're going to do to me, but I'm not scared of you at all. But the text tells us that he's afraid and he runs away. Now, let me be clear about something. He's not afraid of what Jezebel is going to do to him, okay? It doesn't make any sense for him to say, I don't want Jezebel to kill me, and then to run away and say, God, kill me. So it's not that he's afraid of death. What we see in the story is that what he's afraid of is he's afraid of failure. He's like, this time to give up. I, I've given everything that I have to this mission to rid Israel of idolatry, to rid it of false worship. I've given everything I've got and it hasn't worked. And so I'm out. I want you to take my life away from me. What what he's experiencing is very similar to, uh, I know this movie came out a long time ago, uh, but maybe you've seen it. It's on Netflix and so you can go watch it. But the first Rocky movie, okay, in the first Rocky movie, uh, it was about a boxer. Rocky's this, this underdog who's given a shot to face Apollo Creed, who's the champion, never been beaten, never, nobody's ever even gone the distance with him. He's knocked out every opponent that he's ever faced. Rocky's like, all I want to do is just to be able to go the distance. I don't think I can win, but if I can just go the distance, all right? And then Rocky has a little bit more success than people think that he's going to have, and he, he kind of puts up a good fight. But then by the end of the fight, I mean, Creed is just beating the hound out of him. And in the 14th round, like what ends up happening in the 14th round is Creed hits Rocky with an uppercut. He goes down. His legs are gone. He can't stand to his feet at all. He's so badly beaten that his manager in the corner is yelling at him, stay down, stay down. Don't try to get up. And he's just trying to crawl to the ropes and try to get up. Apollo Creed's on the other side in the corner just with his hands raised. He's celebrating. I finally won. Rocky grabs those ropes and pulls himself up. And then Creed turns around and he sees Rocky and Rocky's like waving him on. Like, come on, bring me some more. Bring me some more. And Creed just just drops his head and drops his shoulders. And he's like, I've given this guy everything I have and I can't knock him out. And that's what Elijah's feeling. He's like, I've, I've given everything I have to this mission and it's It's not working, and so, God, I wish that you would kill me. Now, what happens next is the the graciousness of God, because he he lays down, he takes a nap, and then an angel graciously wakes him up, has cooked him a meal, has him eat, has him drink. He lays down, and he takes 
another nap and then he eats another meal and he drinks uh, some more and then he goes 40 days and 40 nights without food and he goes all the way down into the desert to Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, which is where the people of Israel, when they'd come out of Egypt, met with God, received the Ten Commandments, all of those things. But what happens with Elijah here, again, is very instructive to us. When we're struggling mentally, when we are down, when we're feeling despair, we've got to take care of ourselves. The best thing for you to do often when you are down is just to take a step back, eat something, drink something, take a nap, get some exercise, you know, go outside, take a walk. Just, just, you need to take care of yourself physically because your physical condition absolutely has impact on your spiritual and mental condition. It just does. Okay. And so you need to take care of yourself. Many preachers have said sometimes the godliest thing that you can do is take a nap. Okay. And that's, that's true. You've got to be able to get good sleep. One of the things, one of the challenges that you guys have um, at this age is, and, and it, it just doesn't get any better uh, as you get older, as you, you get married, start families, start jobs, is that sleep, whereas, you know, earlier in life you could get eight, nine hours of sleep whenever you wanted. Now all of a sudden it's like, I, I don't get hardly any sleep at all because I'm up late working on term papers or, you know, studying for a test and, and also got to check social media and check the scores and all that kind of stuff. And so don't get a lot of sleep. And then when you get married and start having kids, you don't get a lot of sleep and start a job, you don't get a lot of sleep. And so one of the things that we provide for you um, in that PDF that you're going to see is just some some, some tips on how to get good sleep uh, because it really does, uh, you know, make a difference. And so one of the things that we see in the, um, in the diagnostic manuals when it comes to mental disorders, mental health disorders, is that one of the key signs that you might be struggling and that you might need to reach out to somebody for help is if your diet is, is affected in a drastic way or your sleep patterns are affected in a drastic way. Okay, and, and that, that can go either way. Like when we talk about getting sleep, eating, what we mean is in a balanced way. Because if you do, you know, one extreme or the other, that, that could, that, that's not helpful, all right? So when people are down, sometimes what they'll do is they'll overeat or they won't eat anything at all. Or they'll oversleep or they won't get any sleep at all and they'll kind of be insomniacs. And so uh, we, we need balanced self-care. That's what we need to to practice because our physical realities affect our mental and our spiritual realities. And so if that's you, if you're finding it difficult to sleep or you're oversleeping, difficult to eat or you're overeating, then it might be a sign to you that you need to reach out to somebody. We've got all kinds of resources again in that PDF for you to be able to reach out to somebody and talk to somebody uh, when you need to, because we understand this, right? When you're tired, when you're hangry, it's not the best time to make important decisions. It's not the best time to analyze situations and to see, you know, uh, how things are going because you can blow things out of proportion, all right? And that's the second thing we're going to see here with Elijah. The second strategy is don't catastrophize, okay? You're not alone. Look what the Bible says there in verses 9 and 10. There he came to a cave, and he lodged in it, and behold... The word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. So Elijah meets with God and he catastrophizes. This is um, a word that therapists use to talk about, you know, uh, cognitive distortions that uh, are unhelpful ways of thinking, okay? And, and a lot of times it's like blowing things out of proportion or exaggerating them or seeing them as more dire than they actually are. And that's what he is doing here. He's, these things that he's saying, these excuses that he's making are not true, right? So when he says, I'm all alone, I'm the only one left. Well, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah was told specifically by a man named Obadiah that Obadiah had hidden away a hundred prophets of the Lord in a cave. He was sneaking meals to them and keeping them alive. And so Elijah knows there's at least a hundred people just like him in Israel. He's going to be told at the end of this chapter by God, there's 7,000 people in Israel who are just like you, who've not worshiped Baal, who've not bowed down to him. And so he's not alone, but he feels that way. He feels alone. 
Not only that, he says, they're all trying to kill me. They all aren't trying to kill him. One person's trying to kill him. It's Jezebel. But he's blowing everything out of proportion. He's not seeing reality rightly because he is down and he is uh, hurting. And, and oftentimes when we are down, we see things as more dire than they actually are. We go to worst case scenarios. We start th- saying things like, well, always and never, uh, which is dichotomous thinking. And so it's like we, we do all of these things where we're over-exaggerating how bad things actually are. And we say things like, I have the worst luck in the world. Or I can't ever catch a break. Okay? Now, um, I say this just a, a little bit to try to lighten things up. I, I see on social media sometimes these tweets and these posts that are like, um, hey, if you think you're having a bad day, just remember. And then they tell you some sad story about somebody who's, who's really having a bad day. It's like one of my favorites was, if you think you're having a bad day, just remember. There are people out there who have their ex's name tattooed on their body. Okay, so it could, it, it, could be, it could be worse, all right? But what we have to do is we have to, what the Bible says is that we have to be able to take thoughts captive. You shouldn't always trust your feelings. You shouldn't always trust the thoughts that go into your brain. Like if you're, if you're using this kind of like, well, always or never, then those things shouldn't be trusted, okay? There's, there's exceptions to those things. This is why the, the psalmist says this in Psalm 42, 11. He's talking to himself. He's, he's, he's challenging his thinking. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. And so you should doubt your catastrophic thoughts because there are times in your life, please hear me, there are times in your life when your subjective experience doesn't match reality. And so you've got to question that. You've got to learn, as the Bible says, to count your blessings, okay? I don't know if you've ever done this. It's a, I think it's a really helpful thing to do. I do this about once a month. I, I have a journal that I write in. If you don't do that, then if you start a memo on your phone or whatever, and just begin to think through and to catalog every blessing that you have in your life and be very, uh, you know, be very specific but also be very charitable because I know when, when we're hurting and we're down, it's like, well, I, I don't have any blessings in my life. And it's just like, well, there's some things in your life that you maybe are taking for granted that are God's blessing in your life. And so it could be something as simple as just friendships that you have. It could be being able to go to a school, having your health, okay, having a, a family that you can count on, all right? It could be having a job, being able to provide, you know, for yourself and be able to do certain things that, that you enjoy being able to do, like just write those things down and then think about spiritual blessings that you have. Like if you're a believer in Jesus, there are some things about you that are true. Even if you, again, take them for granted or don't see how true they are in the moment, things like if you're a believer in Jesus, then you're part of the family of God. You get to call God Father and call on him anytime you want. And he'll bear your burdens, okay? Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You've got eternal life. You've got a home in heaven when you die. You've got a church family, a spiritual family of brothers and sisters in Christ who want to bear your burdens, want to pray for you. Like write down all of these things that you have and learn to count your blessings. Some, some people advise that if you're struggling in this way, that when you go to bed at night, you need to be able to think of three things that you're grateful for. Just three things in your life that you're grateful for and how much of an impact that can have on you. And Elijah, he needs these reminders as well. Like he knows deep down that he's not alone, but he's, but he's hurting and so he's isolated himself from everybody else. And let me just tell you, let me plead with you, if you're hurting in this way, please do not isolate. That's a bad decision. That's oftentimes a very deadly decision. And you need, you need people around you to, to help you and to, and to be there with you and for you during these times. God reminds them, again, at the end of this chapter, there's, there's 7,000 people like you. And so you need to be reminded of this. You're not alone. You're not unusual. You're not strange. You're not the only person who's going through this. And you have people in your life. There, there are churches, all kinds of churches around you in this area, in this region, who would love to, to minister to you, to care for you, to help you bear your burdens. You have a, a family here at Carson Newman that wants to do the exact same thing. And so you're not alone. So don't catastrophize. Third strategy is this. We need to meet with God. And, and specifically, let me be very specific, we need to meet with God 
by listening to his word. Look what the Bible says there in verse 11 and 12. And he said, this is God, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. We see here is God is coming after Elijah. He wants to meet with Elijah. And he meets with Elijah, but he doesn't meet with Elijah the way that he had met with prophets before. Like, for example, when Moses was at Mount Horeb, at Mount Sinai, and God showed up there to meet with Moses, how did he show up? He showed up in these really powerful phenomena that we just saw in the text. He showed up in uh, wind and storm. He showed up in an earthquake. He showed up in fire. But here he doesn't show up in all of those things. He shows up for Elijah in a low whisper, his word. He's communicating with Elijah. And one of the challenges that we have so often in modern Christianity is that, is that we really look forward to the, the big powerful signs that we hope God will do, and we ignore the ordinary means of grace that God has given us in the Bible. You can meet with God anytime you want if you'll just open your Bible and you'll read it. And the Bible tells us, there's this theme throughout the Bible that shows us that God is most fundamentally associated with his word. There's amazing statements that are made. For example, in 1 Samuel 3, the Bible says that the Lord appeared to Samuel at Shiloh. Appeared. And so when you say, when you read that Lord, the Lord appeared, you're thinking there's some, this glorious visible manifestation that he's shown up again, whether it's like a glory cloud or fire or whatever it is that he's shown up. But what does the text say? First Samuel three, the Lord appeared to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The way he showed up is he began to talk to Samuel. In Luke 16, there's this incredible story that Jesus tells about a rich man who dies and he goes to hell and then there's a poor man named Lazarus who dies and he goes to heaven and there's this conversation that the rich man in hell is having from hell into heaven with Father Abraham who's sitting there with Lazarus and what the rich man says is he says, he says, Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house because I have five brothers and I don't want them to come to this place. I want them to go to heaven. And so send Lazarus to talk to them. And if somebody goes to them from the dead, they'll listen to him. And what Abraham says is they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. Let them hear them. And he says, no father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will believe. And he says, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if someone is raised from the dead. And so we, we, if we want to meet with God, and I'm not saying God doesn't speak outside the Bible, but, but if you really, like, if you want to know for sure that you're hearing from God, then open the Bible and read it. You can meet with him. You can draw nourishment from the Bible. We're going to give you in that PDF a, a, a sheet that shows you how to discern the, the voice and the will of God uh, and how it, it can, you can see that it's consistent with the Bible. But if you're down, if you're hurting, there's nothing more important in your life than to get into God's word and to have it reorient your thoughts. You need to read the Bible, you need to preach these truths to yourself, and you need to pray, Lord, I believe these things, but help my unbelief. You need to hear things like this when you're hurting. Psalm 3, verses 3 and 4, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Psalm 34, 17 and 18, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Are you heartbroken? The Bible says that the Lord is near you. Psalm 84, 11 and 12, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God doesn't want to withhold anything good from you. You'll just trust him. 
So you need to draw nourishment from the Bible. You need to have a Bible by your bedside that you can read. You need to have an app on your phone that you can listen to. If there's videos on YouTube of, of worship songs or sermon jams or whatever that, that bring you encouragement and help you when you're hurting, then have those saved and ready to play when you're down. Okay? And so get into the Word and, and let the Word bring nourishment to your body. As one of my uh, counseling friends told me, if that's, if that's something that you can't do, like when you're hurting and if you read the Bible and you draw no encouragement from it, no comfort from it, then he said it's, it's kind of like being a spiritual diabetic. In the same way that a physical diabetic can't draw the nutrients that they need from food in order to bring health to their body, if you're not able to, to bring nutrients from the Bible and bring health to your soul, then that's, again, a sign that you might need to reach out to somebody and talk to somebody and say, man, I, I need some help because this isn't bringing me encouragement right now. And so we need, to, we need to meet with God. And the last thing that we see in the story is that we need to embrace the good news of Jesus Christ. We need to embrace the good news of Jesus Christ. Elijah ultimately points us to Jesus and to God's plan to set all things right through Jesus' death and resurrection. I mean, think about the similarities between Elijah and Jesus, right? Like uh, Elijah, Jesus raises the dead. Like Elijah, Jesus goes 40 days and 40 nights without food. Like Elijah, Jesus' miracles make his enemies more determined to kill him, not less determined to kill him. Like Elijah, Jesus knows what it's like to experience disappointment in your ministry. But unlike Elijah, Jesus actually dies and rises again before he ascends into heaven so that he can do away with brokenness and sadness once and for all. Unlike Elijah, Jesus goes to a mountain, goes to Calvary, but there he doesn't meet with God. He's forsaken by God so that you can be accepted by God. And here's what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, which is this prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus dies on the cross that talks about Jesus taking our sin and taking the curse and taking death on himself at the cross. But here's what it also says. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus on the cross is a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. That on the cross, Jesus is taking your sadness, your hurt, your heartbreak on himself so that one day he can wipe away every single tear from your eyes. So here's what the gospel of Jesus Christ tells you. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells you that God loves you, that God is for you, and that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And so you need to embrace the gospel because God will never, ever, ever give up on you. And so let me, just, let me just close with this and then we'll sing one more song and then we'll have folks here available at the front. If you're hurting or you know somebody who's hurting and you want to be prayed with or prayed for, we're gonna have folks here at the front who would love to pray for you uh, when we conclude before you go back to class. But let me just say this as we, as we wrap up. And I don't want, you know, I want everybody to look up here just for a second. I know, you know, you get distracted and, and uh, who is this guy and everything, but I, I wanted to say something to you. I, wa I want you to hear me, okay, before we leave, before you go back to class. And here's what I want you to hear. God loves you. God sent his, he loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you. And not only does God love you, but this school loves you. Like our faculty, our staff, our administrators, they love you. And here, please hear me. We have, we have gifted people all across this campus that could do any number of things with their life. And guess what they chose to do with their life? They chose to invest their life in you because they think you matter, because they think you're worth it, because they think you're valuable. Even if you don't feel those things, that's what they believe about you. And so you have a school that loves you, you have a savior that loves you, and so do not give up. Because please hear me, here's what the gospel of Jesus Christ tells you. Let me just conclude where we started. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells you that in Christ, your life is useful, you can do things right, and your life should be enjoyed. We wanna help you find your path and find your purpose, and so know that you are loved and do not give up. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for you and then let's worship just briefly. Father, I thank you so much for this place, for this school, for these students. I'm glad that they're here and I pray, Lord, that they would fight for mental wellness. 
that they would take care of themselves physically, that they would doubt their catastrophic thoughts, that they would meet with you in the word and, and, and it would bring nourishment and encouragement to them. And Lord, most of all, that they would embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would believe Jesus died for them, not just for their sin, but for their sadness, for their heartbreak, for their brokenness, that he was raised from the dead and that new life is available in him. Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's his name that we pray. Amen.